My name is Gavin Jennings. I'm a consultant orthopedic surgeon specializing in shoulder problems. This presentation is the second of three parts providing an in-depth overview of rotator cuff disease. This part deals with the symptoms, examination and non-operative treatment of patients with rotator cuff problems. In the diagnosis of rotator cuff disease, we need to consider the onset, site and timing of the pain, as well as aggravating factors. If we exclude significant one-off traumatic injury, a typical presentation would be of a gradual onset pain, often spontaneous or perhaps after some unaccustomed activity, and sometimes after what initially felt like a small muscle pull. The pain is usually felt in the region of the deltoid, but not beyond the elbow. The pain is made worse by lifting the arm up from the side, reaching out in front, or when lying on that side at night. The arm usually feels fine when down by the side. Examination of the shoulder specifically for rotator cuff problems still starts with an assessment of the neck, looking to eliminate the cervical nerve root compression as a cause of the shoulder pain. I find Sperling's test useful for this. With pure cuff disease, passive range of motion should be well maintained, particularly external rotation, though forward flexion and abduction are often limited due to pain generated as opposed to actual stiffness. Attention should be paid to core stability, posture, scapular control and any dyskinesis. Impingement tests such as Nears, Jobes, Hawkins, Kennedy, etc. If positive, will produce deltoid pattern pain. Finally, examination for possible primary causes such as instability, particularly in the younger patient, should be considered. Subacromial steroid and local anaesthetic injections can be useful both diagnostically and therapeutically. Subacromial injections can be given either by a posterior or a lateral route. Following an injection, the patient should be re-examined after a few minutes, repeating the previously positive provocative tests, which should then be less painful. If they are not, two possibilities are that the injection was incorrectly placed or that the diagnosis of cuff disease was incorrect. If we consider the role of physical therapy in the treatment of rotator cuff problems, it's worth recalling the statement from part one of this presentation. Younger patients are more likely to have rotator cuff dysfunction because of overuse, subtle instability or muscle imbalance. It's certainly worth addressing any such problems in a patient of any age with these issues. The other principles of rehabilitation include addressing any issues of core stability, scapulothoracic control, stretching out tight structures, restoring cuff balance, especially eccentrically, and posture for de-education. Finally, I'd like to consider some of the other potential non-operative treatments for cuff disease. Ultrasound therapy has been shown to be of short-term benefit in calcific tendonitis. Extracorporeal shockwave therapy, which uses sound waves, has been shown to be effective in calcific tendinopathy, but not tendonitis without calcium deposition. Suprascapular nerve blockade or ablation has been demonstrated to be of use in long-term pain relief. There is little evidence of the use of the other modalities listed here. Many thanks for listening to part two of an overview of rotator cuff disease. Part three will deal with the role of surgery. If you'd like any further information, please feel free to contact.